Tonight, um, I am going to be talking about um, a verse that I have always hated. <laughs> and the reason why is because it has been taken so far out of context that I just would rather not read it. Well, obviously that's not a good idea to have. Just because there's people who misuse something doesn't mean you shouldn't use it, right? I see people who drive cars while they're drunk. Does that mean I shouldn't drive a car? I see people who shoot up schools with guns. Does that mean I shouldn't have a gun? So I mean like, it, somebody else misusing something doesn't mean that I should not use it. Okay, so, um, that verse is Romans chapter eight. <laughs> And we'll start in verse 18. Eighteen? Eighteen, yes. Um, you know, it's so weird that this morning... Do, do you know how many times pastor has told me what he's going to be talking about? And the entire time that I've been at this church, twice. One of those times was more of an ambiguous area of thought that he thought he was going to talk about. He really didn't flesh out what that was going to look, at, look like. And, uh, but this morning, after, you know, pastor never talks about hell or, or any of those things. You know, he, he, we never talk about that kind of stuff. We, we talk about more, it's called applicational stuff. Things that more apply to your day to day. Um, and then this morning, what of it? Pastor out of nowhere says something that actually is exactly connects to what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So, um. Yeah, sometimes it feels like the situation is tears down. And so we tell ourselves different things to make ourselves believe that it's somehow better. For instance, everything happens for a reason. Have you heard somebody say, heard people say that before? Well, everything happens for a reason. Actually, no. No, actually, it does not happen for a reason. <laughs> that's not biblical. That's not even realistic. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Um, or you hear people sing about how God is going to bring them blessings and make everything work out so that they can be happy and get everything they want. Well, their life is all about how much pleasure they can get. God will never disappoint them. Everything in their life will just go hunky-dory all the time. God won't ever let me down. He won't ever let something happen to me that would possibly make me upset. You know, and, and so then... The, the verse Romans 8.28, which is one of the verses we're going to be looking at tonight, is that's, that's the dreaded verse for me. Because this is what, this is what people hear when they, when they read Romans 8.28. And I know I haven't even talked about that verse. Just give me a second. Um, but basically, this is what they hear. They hear, all things in life are making me happier. Everything in life is here for me to be happy. Okay. Well, that's an idea. So we're, we're going to look at that. Romans 8, starting in verse 18. See, I told you it was our most hated. Pastor hates this verse so much that he just yeah. up and disappeared. See that? We've heard a lot of people misuse this verse. <laughs> okay, so Romans 8.18 says this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For that this, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set uh, free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees? Mm -hmm. Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Then hop down to verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those who he foreknew, he also uh, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Okay, so there's a lot of big words there. Don't worry, we'll get them one at a time. Well, let's, let's, let's back up and look at verse 18 first. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. 
See, basically what he's saying is your, the problems in life that you are facing are not even worthy of being in the same sentence. Mm, that's good. That's good. That's a powerful statement. All we deal with in life day to day is our problems. What he's saying here is, I consider that the sufferings, the problems that you have right now are not even worth mentioning in comparison to the glory that is coming. Well, that's quite a big, that's quite a big statement. That is quite a big statement. So let's kind of see how he unwinds this. Verses 19 through 21. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay and to the glorious freedom of God's children. Okay. So let's look at that. When Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't just them that suffered. It was people after them who would come, okay, because we were all born into that problem, right? But here's another problem, okay, right here in verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Well, who subjected it to futility? Adam. What? Adam. That's, that was a common, common view a long time ago, that Adam subjected it. But wouldn't that kind of mean that it was taken out of God's hands and put into Adam's hands? See what I mean? So we know it was an Adam who was subjected by it. So then the next side common theory was Satan. Satan subjected it to futility, but we have the exact same problem. It is taken out of God's hands and put into somebody else's hands, regardless of who that someone else is. So that's not really a, a satisfying answer either. So who then is left is only God. God subjected the creation to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free. In other words... When Adam and Eve sinned, God subjected his creation to the pointlessness that you see, which is where Ecclesiastes comes in. Hopefully, or futile, uh, was vanity of vanities, or in other translations read, futility of all futilities, everything is futile. Everything has been subjected to futility by God. Why? For the hope of the coming glory. In other words, God subjected the creation to futility knowing that people would start doing animal sacrifices and those kinds of things. God didn't invent animal sacrifices. People were practicing those long before God ever gave the law. He, saw, he used that as, as an opportunity to show them what it meant to die on behalf of something. And then he was able to send Jesus to show us the hope of glory. That's kind of a, that's kind of a big thing. That God, who just got done making this perfect thing, then subjected it to futility for the hope that even one person would be saved. That's a powerful statement. In other words, God said, okay, the infinite galaxies that I've created are worth less than you. That is a powerful statement. They haven't even found the edge of space, if there even is an edge of space. And there's so much. You know how long they say that it took for God's initial, um, they call it the Big Bang, but God's initial forming of all matter? Three minutes. That first day when it says that God spoke, and it was, they say that scientifically it took about three minutes for all that to just... In the time that it takes you to make a sandwich... I do what? I yeah, you, you, just, you just go pray. <laughs> okay, so. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. Okay, alright. So let's keep going on this. God subjected all creation. Okay. God's sons revealed. Now what does that mean? It means that until things are set right, things will be wrong. Now, New Age teachers are real big in this. It's a gradual, everything's going get, to get better and better throughout the, throughout the years, and, and eventually we're all going to learn, we're gonna, all going to have enough knowledge, and we're just going to evolve into higher beings and that kind of stuff. You know, that New Age kind of nonsense. And that's exactly the opposite of what Paul just said. Everything's going to continue to be broken until God makes it not broken. Okay. So then that takes us to the next part here. So he's talking about the resurrection at the end of the age. 
Did you know that humanity is not the only thing that's going to be resurrected at the end of the age? The entire creation is going to be resurrected too. Because this model that we see around us is not as it is supposed to have been. Some people have said this kind of similar, this kind of line of thought. Well, if, if God is so good and he made everything good, then why do we have animals eating animals? Well, very simple, because it wasn't supposed to be like that. We have the effects of a fallen world. Luckily, it's not going to be like that forever, though, right? Okay, so, we can't make a, 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 a perfect world because God has subjected the world to futility. So that means that all these humanistic philosophy, philosophies of trying to reach perfection without God by just trying to be a better person is doomed to failure. Because God has subjected it to futility, and he will not unsubject it until the resurrection. Well, that kind of puts a, what is it called, a, a, a screw in our balloon, huh? <laughs> Anyways. Um, okay, so the world is bound to decay. See that in verse uh, 21? That the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. Now, he's going to build on this. That is why there is disease. That's why there's death. That's why there's decay. In the law, they couldn't use um, fermented things in sacrifices because the fermentation is a sign of death. For we know that the whole creation, verse 22, that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Now, what does that mean? Well, I don't really think you have to think real hard about this. We have hurricanes that hit the coast. We have tsunamis. We have all kinds of, you know, volcanoes. I mean, let's go down the list. Um, not only that, but we ourselves who have um, this... Sorry, I lost my place. But only, not, not only that, but we are ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits. We also go within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, we, we have the Holy Spirit. And we still are in pain and agony, waiting for the day. Now, what does that mean, in pain and agony? Not all of us are sick. I see some elderly people here who aren't groaning in their seats. I see some young people here who are not groaning. So what does that mean? That brokenness that you feel, the thing, the way that everything tends to go wrong, like the majority of the time, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we're talking about. But it all, he's also talking about sickness. He's also talking about death. Okay, so, I mean, I'm not keeping up with my thing here. Normally I have been to help me. So the Holy Spirit's work in us is a glimpse of what is to come. See what he said there in verse 23? Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits. Now, what does it mean, the first fruits? It means the first of what is to come. In other words, the Holy Spirit's work in our life today is proof of what is going to happen on a much larger scale in the resurrection. The Holy Spirit is our first fruits. So when you're broken and you cry out to God and you feel that comfort that goes beyond all understanding, that's just a taste of what is to come in the resurrection. The first fruits. So 24 and 25. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope because... Because who hopes for what he sees? <laughs> Boy, I hope that I'll be able to stand today and read from the Bible. Oh, well, I guess I can. Huh? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. So, our salvation is according to this hope. We don't see right now. We're broken. We feel things. We are crushed. But we know that one day we'll be set free from that hope. Yes. We have hope. And when we die, we don't have to mourn about that death. That means you finally got what you were always searching for in this whole life. Amen. Amen. Well, that's not something to grieve about. It's something to grieve about if you don't know God. Yes. Yes. 
So not so don't uh, okay. So not everything happens for a reason, and God is not always bringing things by that will make me perfectly happy in this life. Rather, that's exactly the opposite of what has just been said. He just said, okay, you have some serious problems, but guess what? It's nothing in comparison to what is to come. Mm -hmm. Not in this life, but there. Mm -hmm. so that's exactly the opposite of what we've been told. Everything is for me. God is going to make me happy. It's all about me. Nope. <laughs> so... Basically, the problem is this. Is there a problem? Are you sick? Are you disappointed in life? Do you have something, a problem? Focus on the hope of what's coming. God, you don't understand how broken I am. But wait till you see how whole you will be made. Amen. But, but God, I can't fix this problem. Don't worry about it. It's going to pass away in the, in, the, in the new age anyways. Don't worry about it. It's all going to pass away. But God, work is really, don't worry about it, it'll be burned with fire. Everything that we're working so hard to build in this life, God's going to follow after us and burn it. Why work so hard and get yourself so stressed out about problems that you don't think that there's a solution to, rather than seeking God? Now, I'm not saying don't work. Work. I'm not saying that at all. Okay, so... Problems Christians face are being used by God for our greater good. That's what we're going to be looking at here. Because that takes us to the end of verse 24 through 25. Now, you might say, okay, so why are we skipping over 26 and 27? Well, Paul, in a larger argument, Paul is talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He has taken a brief diversion from that in verse 18, which is where we started looking at. And then in verses 26 and 27, he goes back and starts talking about that. And then he goes back in 28 to talk about something else. That's why we're not looking at verses, verses 26 and 27. Because it goes with the argument before verse 18, and I, we're not looking at that argument, okay? So, just skip over those verses. Um, I'll just go back to this until I'm reading. Uh, so, we patiently continue to wait with hope of what is to come. So, what is hope? Hope is the confident expectation of promise. It's the confident expectation of a promise. We hope, but our hope isn't based on nothing. No, Jesus himself was resurrected, and his disciples saw him, and they passed it on down to us. This is not a myth, this is something that they actually saw with their own eyes. Hundreds of them saw this, and that was a sign to us of what is to come for us. If he was resurrected, then so will we be. See, he gave us proof. We don't hope in nothing. We don't have faith in nothing. We have faith for a reason. Okay. So everything is futile. Every Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanity, all is, all is vanity. Everything is vanity. Everything is futile in this life. Unless it's building into the next life. This is, this is what he says in Ecclesiastes. How do you know if this thing that you've been working on, how do you know that somebody won't come after you and destroy it? Well, I don't know that. I don't know that at all. So what's the point of it all? Because we're building into the future. Our lives are not about now. They're about the future. We're building into something that lasts. Something that lasts. When it happens, problems won't matter. Did you realize that? When the resurrection happens, our problems won't matter. See, they matter to us now because the resurrection hasn't happened yet. So if there are problems, that means we have hope. What? Yes. If there are problems, that means that we have hope because we know that it's a sign of the futility that this world has been subjected to, which is where our hope of salvation lies. Well, okay, this is looking better now. Now we have, he's working for me, verse... He's giving me meaning to these situations which would have been painful and meaningless otherwise. Without God, the things you're going through, the problems that you're facing would be meaningless. Pointless. 
there would be no point for you persevering or not persevering. There, it would be pointless. You do whatever you want. But in that resurrection, we have the hope for why we remain. He's working in these things for our ultimate good, even though it hurts. Look at what Romans 8, 28 says. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Okay, now, what's the, what's the subject there of that sentence? Yeah. See what I mean? Is it that things are just randomly happening for our benefit? Is it that we are making things work out for our benefit? Is it that God is working all things to our benefit? That's right. God. Build it, he knows how it operates. So that takes us in verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. What makes it work together for the good? God. God is now, – now, hold on. I, I want to make sure everybody's getting what he's saying here. That's, that means – he just talked about how our problems are nothing in comparison to the glory that's coming. Okay, now he's saying, and those problems are themselves being used for your own good. What? Okay, well, hold on. Let's go to verse 29 and see how it relates. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, I'm going to break down these words, okay? First off, we have foreknew. God knew who would be saved. He foreknew you. Before you were born, he knew what you would make, what choice you would make, okay? Then we have predestined. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's not predestined. Predestined to be conformed. Don't make a doctrine here. Predestined to be conformed, okay? What that means is that nothing in life is a surprise to God, but God destined everything that we face to make us like Christ. He predestined the problems that you are going through to make you into the image of Christ. That means our victory is assured in Christ. Because he's working it all for a greater good, because he predestined all those things to work in us the character of Christ. That means no matter what problem we're facing, we are, God is working in it to make in us the image of Christ. Well, that's a lot different than I always heard this verse growing up. That's a lot different. And that's also a lot more hopeful than this verse. If God follows me around giving me blessing after blessing and then I die and go to hell, what, to what benefit is that? To what benefit is that? If I spend all my years in pleasure and I die and go to hell and never once had an impact on another human being's life, what am I benefited? But if my problems do have a, have, have a meaning, if God – now, 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 let me kind of back up here. Our problems don't have meaning. God gives our problems yes. meaning. Yes. Because something that was intended for our destruction – God has reworked and predestined to rework it long before it ever surprised you. Long before it came out of right field and smacked you upside the head. God predestined that smack you upside the head to work in you the character of Christ. Amen. Praise God. Wow. Now, the next time you're blindsided by a situation that's completely unfair and completely unexpected, remember this. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image. That is a promise. That is a promise. And that is something worth holding on to. So all these things are working in us for our greater good. But God is painful. But it's for our good. See, notice that I didn't say that God causes a bunch of bad things to happen to people. I said he works through the situations that are already happening to people and gives them meaning and purpose. That's a big difference. Big difference. So every situation, God is working good from it. Um, although it does need to be said, said that this is a promise to Christians. Right. This is not for everyone. So what does that mean? If I am not a Christian, does that mean that my problems are being worked to my greater good? Well, no one yet. So let me kind of break that down. First off, no. God is not – I, I want to make sure I get all the, all the aspects of this. No, because you are not being worked into the image of Christ, because you have rejected Christ. Yes, because God is still using things to try and get you to meet Christ. So, yes and no. <laughs> However, 
the promise of the resurrection, all those things are for Christians only. So, um, why do bad things happen? We live in a fallen world that, that God has subjected to futility. According to his purpose. Now, notice this. It says in verse 28, We know that all things work together for, for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So here we have the dual side here. Of those who love God, are called to love God. Okay? That's our side. Who are called according to his purposes. His side. See, there's kind of a, a back and forth there. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that, that we are equal partners with God? Well, yes and no. We are co-laborers with God. Yes. Okay. But we aren't doing equal amounts of work. I'll leave it at that. Okay, so, um, according to his purposes, it's all about him and initiated by him. That's what that verse there, well, that's what that sentence there is to mean. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. We are called according to his purposes. But why would I just give up? Because you've been called according to God's purposes. Well, I don't feel like I can do this anymore. Well, you're wrong. You can still do it. Why? Because God has gone before us and predestined this thing to work us into the image of Christ. That means that we're destined to succeed. Do you understand how that works? If God predestines something and he's not blindsided by it, he already knows it's going to work, for, work into a victory. Because he's going to work it into a victory. There's some hopeful things here. So, I already talked about foreknowing and predestining. We're, we're getting ready to wrap up here. Problems Christians face have been used. Okay. There it is. Okay. All things God is using to work Christ's character in us for what is coming. Okay. All right. I want to make sure I didn't leave anything out here. So that takes us to verse 30. And those he predestined, he also called. See, because he said in verse 20, who are called according to his purposes. So then he says in verse 30, and those he predestined, in other words, those who he foreknew, so therefore he predestined for the things to work in them, the character of Christ, for those people, he also called them. See, we have a little bit of a wraparound here, okay? Mm -hmm. Who are called according to his purposes. In verse 28, mm -hmm. are you seeing what he's saying here? Let, let me kind of wrap it up. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. Okay. Now he puts a pin in that, in that whole calling thing. For those who he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Okay, now, now we can go back in verse 30. Um, and those he predestined, he also called. The very fact that you are going through problems is a promise to you that God is working character in you. It's a promise to you that God has not given up. It's a promise that there is something better coming. Don't look at your problems with, oh, I have so many problems. Look at your problems as... This is proof sent from God that he is working in me and that he has not given up. Well, okay. Well, that makes our situations a little bit better, huh? And those he predestined, he also <coughs> called. And those he called, he also justified. Now, justified is more of a legal term. No longer guilty. Justified means you are no longer guilty. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, glorified is, means things are progressively getting better. See, first you were saved, then you had the Spirit given to you, then you had God working character in you, and then there's going to be a resurrection. He glorified us. It's a progressive, it's, it's a progress, a progressive thing that God is doing in us for what is to come. Yeah. All right, that, sound, that sounds like, okay, I can do with this. So we are included in the process here. God doesn't just do things. He also does things with us. God has glory in working through us. Okay, look what it says there. And those he predestined, he also called. We aren't backseat drivers here, okay? He called us. He knows the outcome, but it's still our choice. We don't have to follow, but there's good things if we do. So that takes us to the conclusion here. Our pointless and chaotic problems meet an intentional and loving God. I'll say that one more time. Our pointless and chaotic problems meet an intentional and loving God. Mm -hmm. yes. I want to make sure that you guys get this. I feel like you're not as excited as I am about this. Our pointless and chaotic problems 
meet an intentional and loving God. God is intentional with what he does. Yeah. Even though it doesn't always appear that way. Even though it doesn't always appear that way. Now that's where the whole hope comes in. For who hopes what is already seen. Okay. So our hope outweighs our problems. We're okay. All our problems God is using for our greater good to make us like him. We're okay. Can you live with that? Yes. Well, good, because you only have a couple years and you're going to die anyway, so you might as well get used to it. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go ahead and close it up there. Um, I don't think there's a potluck tonight, right? No. Oh, there is. There, I'm sorry, there is. So I'm going to close in prayer, and when I'm done, uh, can I have um, check pray for the food when I'm done? Closing prayer? Yes? No? Lord, I, I pray you would help us to endure, help us to grow, and help us to stay focused on you. In our problems, help us to remember that you are working something. Help us always remember that you are working something. And help our brokenness to be a reminder of hope. So that as Satan seeks to bring all these things by to show us the hopelessness and pointlessness, we would remember that it is a sign of the glory to come. And even the most unhopeful situation would be to us as a joy because we know it is a sign of what is to come. And I pray that you continue the work of the Holy Spirit who is the first fruit of what is to come. Once again, Lord, help us to endure, help us to grow, and help us to focus, to stay focused. Check. Father God, I was looking for you. I was listening. Oh, I was going to ask you to.